Hello, everybody. I'm Anna Seymour. I'm Professor of Drama Therapy at the University of Roehampton in London. But today I'm joining you from my study in my home in Manchester in the north of England, because I'm in lockdown, as we all are at the moment. Um, I'm going to be sharing some thoughts, some experiences of teaching online. And I guess how that has become so such a preoccupation for us all now in the train in the context of training and all the new skills and things that we've had to learn in this time but how that's affected all of us and how it's affected the experience of being a student but also the experience of being a teacher well thank you for inviting me and I'm looking forward to thinking together because obviously I'm recording this today. And thank you to the person who's going to have the task of translating what I'm saying into Greek. I'm very grateful to you. And I'm grateful for, to Stelios and to all of you for inviting me to be a part of this event where we can think together and think, you know, internationally, because I know there are other dear colleagues who are presenting in this uh, symposium. So there's going to be various elements in what I'm speaking uh, about. And I want to begin with a story. And it will be a story that will be a kind of free form delivery, although I have a few trusty notes here next to me. And then I'll be moving on to a more formal PowerPoint. I guess I want to prefix everything with a statement about my own anxieties about working online, about even the use of PowerPoint. Anybody who knows me knows that I rarely ever use PowerPoints. In fact, it was probably a year, a year or so ago that I was in the United States and the presenter was there of, of a whole uh, group of group of um, presenters saying, um, Anna, I'll just fill people in, you know, give a few announcements or whatever while you load up your PowerPoint, I had to very swiftly say, oh, it's okay, I don't have a PowerPoint. What I wish I'd said in that moment was, I don't need to load up, I'm already coming fully loaded. But I didn't have the presence of mind to say that at the time, that was an afterthought. But I guess to begin, really, I, I, I am going to talk about some of the, the anxieties and how of, of working online and how it can make us feel very vulnerable, because it seems to me that in sharing those difficulties with each other, we can learn. But also, I think it sometimes it kind of disperses those anxieties that we we may be feeling when we can actually share how hard it is for us. Now, this is about this story is about a significant piece of teaching that I was doing in the autumn in 2020. This was in September 2020. So I convene a module which is across the five arts and play therapies uh, programs that art, dance, play, music and drama therapy. So we have students from all these modalities training at the University of Roehampton. And we all come together for a three day intensive module called Research Methodologies and Methods. Now, this is the first time this was taught online. And I, as the convener, had to think through with colleagues how we might deliver these three days online with students joining us from five modalities from different parts of the country and even some students from international contexts. So just a few of the figures here. There were 130 students who were going to participate. These are students on our master's programmes, both full time and part time students. There were 12 members of staff presenting. 10 alumni coming back to give presentations and five PhD students. Now, as the convener, my task was not only to 
guide and think through the content and delivery of this curriculum, but also to do practical things like create the Zoom links to make sure that everybody knew what they were, to make sure that they were posted to everybody, to make sure that people had their abstracts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in this time of preparation, I can tell you that my anxiety was rising. It was the first time that we had delivered these three days of teaching online. So this is a little bit about my anxiety and this, I promise you, grows as this story develops. But of course, the students are also bringing their anxiety. Now, in a usual year, without the pandemic, students are anxious when they arrive at this point in their training. This is for all sorts of reasons. Many students come with a statement of adjustments. What does that mean? That they may have a diagnosis of dyslexia or dyspraxia. Some students come with what can be described, and some people describe it in this way, as educational trauma. Their memory of learning historically is one of inadequacy. I'm not clever enough. I'm not sure that I can do this. I've been shamed, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really not, I'm just simply not good enough. And now I'm facing studying a module that has all sorts of complex terminology like epistemology, for instance, ontology, these research terms that students find quite intimidating and they start to retreat. And they start to say things like, well, the thing is, I want to be a therapist. I want to be an art therapist because I want to help people. And, I, and I'm a creative person and I want to use my creativity. I don't want to do that sort of academic stuff. I, that, no, 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 that's not really me. I mean, that's not really what I do. And of course, as an educator, this is a moment to bring those different elements, which are so sharply in focus now, together and to reassure students that first of all they can do it but also that this pursuit of studying these complex ideas these complex theoretical ideas about how we research our practice and then disseminate that research is a vital part of what we do a vital part of preserving and developing our thinking, but preserving our practices and moving forward into the future, explaining to other professionals what we do, gathering evidence of our practice and validating it. So from that critical distance, we're able to really embrace the complexity of the processes that we engage in in the arts therapies. So there's some very real tensions around when we get to this point, because this module that I'm describing is the preparation for writing the master's dissertation, which is eight to 10,000 words of writing. Now for some students, this is quite terrifying. So their processes of resistance, of fear, are all going to be in the mix of the encounters that we have in this module. So I'm thinking about all of this as I prepare to give the opening lecture. And bear in mind now there are 130 students who are all going to arrive on Zoom as tiny little postage stamps on my screen. Now I've already said I'm no great technology person at all. This isn't my medium. My medium is embodied practice. I come from the theatre. I was an actor, I was a director, I've had loads of years of experience of going into rooms and working with my body and working with people live. So this idea of this working with this screen is quite alien to me. It feels as if parts of myself are missing and I can't use them. I have to trust a medium that I'm quite afraid of. 
So there's a parallel process going on there between me as the teacher and the students, but for different reasons. Although in my opening lecture, I'm planning to share some of my story with the students. Aspects of my story of feeling not good enough, of being told at school, mm, not quite sure your university material. Well, that's because I went to a posh school and I was a working class child who didn't quite fit into the smartness of the school that my smartness and my intelligence enabled me to get into. But that's another story and I'm not going to go into that now. So here I am in this morning, my heart pounding quite a lot, I have to say. Welcoming, well, admitting the students from the waiting room into the screen. And we're about to begin. Now, I've decided that I'm going to use a piece of music to open the session. And it's by it's performed by a band called Music for Change. And perhaps some of you know this band and you may well have heard their different recordings of a song called Stand By Me, a popular, wonderful song. And I've chosen to use a recording of a live performance that takes place in Brazil, in which the chorus is sung in Spanish and this group are a multi-ethnic group. And the whole feel of this performance is celebratory, but also embedded in this performance is a real sense of being together and facing fear. So the idea that if we work together, we can do this, we can sort this. And for me, that was a really important concept to really think about at the beginning of this teaching to launch us into facing what we need to face. So I begin, much as I've just begun now with you, saying hello, hello, this is who I am. And I'm hoping I'll get to know quite a lot of you. I know the drama therapy students, some others of you I've met. And I'm hoping that over these three days, I'll get to meet you and maybe one day we'll meet face to face. I'm now going to move into playing a piece of music. And then I'll be giving a lecture that's linked to this piece of music. Now, I prepared very carefully some key phrases from the song that were going to be embedded in the structure of the lecture. And I felt quite pleased with myself about this. So I went on to screen share. Where was the song? Where was it? Well, I couldn't find it. I didn't know where it was. I'm going to look at my notes now. I'd set everything up, or so I thought. So right now, 130 students are watching me and I'm the only professor in the arts and play therapies. I'm launching this module and I can't find my music. They're watching me fumbling around the screen with my mouse. Here's my mouse now. My mouse is going everywhere and I'm clicking and nothing's happening or I'm clicking and everything closes down and then it opens up and I can feel my heart pounding and pounding. And I'm pretty scared at this point. What's more, as I'm doing this, I lean forward and there's a glass of water like this one, except I don't pick it up. As I lean forward, I knock the glass of water over. So now, not only can I not find this piece of music, but now the mouse is swimming in a sea of water. There's water all over my notes. My trousers are sopping wet and I'm sitting next to a window. 
every bit of me felt at that moment, I just like to jump out the window. I mean, the thing is, I was on the second floor, so I wasn't likely to do that. But the point about this is, it was a moment of absolute panic. Because I really felt. I don't know what to do now. I don't know what to do. Maybe I'll cry, but what will I do? And all of this is being witnessed by 130 people who are contained within this square. I wondered if my computer would blow up. That's how ignorant I am. Well, maybe it would have done, I don't know. Maybe my computer would have blown up. So what do I do? Well, having fumbled around for quite a long time, having gone through, can I completely rewrite the lecture in my head right now? I realised that would be stupid. I realised that the song was, as I've said, embodied within the structure of the lecture. And so the signposting of the lecture, those moments were there in relation to the song. So it just felt like a crucial thing that I couldn't give up on. So I looked out at this sea of tiny faces and said, can anybody help me? Well, I was met with so many offers. And one of the students said, it's OK, Anna, I'll, I think I can do this. And very confidently, within a few minutes, she found the music, she played it, and everybody experienced a great joy of actually having listened to it. Now, the end of this story is actually a lovely story. I mean, I then had to carry on and give the lecture. And I have to say, it took me a few minutes to breathe deeply. And as the music was playing, I got a cloth. I, I wiped the desk. I, 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 I dried my clothes and just decided to take a deep breath and say, it's all right, Anna, now you can get going. Well, I learned a lot from that experience and I realise it's very akin to other experiences that I've had where actually what I was doing was being working, really working with the people I'm working with, reaching out beyond the confines of this screen and really recognising that there was help there if I could ask for it. Later, I got so many emails from students thanking me, saying, thank you for sticking with it. The music was wonderful. It was entirely appropriate. But thanks. Thank you for showing us your vulnerability. Thank you for showing us your practice. Thank you for being honest. Thank you for being open. Thank you for sticking with it and finding and eventually we found that music and so at the end of the three days upon a request from the students we closed the whole of the intensive three days of all that working with all those complex ideas we ended it with a playing of that music very smoothly because one of my PhD students set it up for me and clicked the button and we all unmuted and we sang a song called Stand By Me Together. So it became emblematic of our journey together and the struggles that were involved in that. So this is my opening to my presentation. It, it's, a, it's a story of what my dad would have called a, a disaster, a terrible disaster, but actually something joyful came out of it. So now I'm going to share my screen and move into a PowerPoint that I've prepared.
And here we are. This was the title that I sent, Pedagogy in COVID Times, Managing the Twists and Turns. Well, of course, there's a great deal to say. And what I'll be doing is, is sharing some thoughts, some experiences, as, as I've said, and hoping that when on Sunday that we can have more of a discussion together. So the themes that I'm looking at are three. I'm going to think about the conditions in which we're working, the effects of COVID on the ways in which we can we can work and how that's then going to affect what we might bring to this process of teaching and learning online. And then I'm going to move into how the actual process of teaching online might affect us. So what do we bring and what does it to, to this, this virtual world and what does it give to us? So it's an exploration in some respects of that relationship. So let me begin by thinking about the working conditions. Well, of course, some of our teaching, uh, um, I imagine, certainly for me in the early days of the pandemic was face to face, but it was socially distanced. So the rule in the UK at that point was that we needed to be two metres um, apart. So the group that I was working with at that point was a group of 10 master's students and I work with them for two days a week from 10 till 6 in a studio space. So each day I needed to go into the room at the start of the day and each student was allocated a chair and I would measure the distance with my trusty tape measure, a distance of two metres and set that chair. The chairs were all sanitised, they were cleaned. When the students came, everybody was masked and we asked our students to bring with them a suitcase or a container of some sort to bring everything that a drama therapist brings to their practice. Fabrics, objects, coloured pens, paper, pencils. So the kind of things that a drama therapist in practice might take to the place where they're going to do their clinical work. And normally, of course, we would be providing all these things as an educational institution. But now we're asking the students to bring everything themselves, to place all of these things underneath their chair or by the side of their chair. And that's their bubble of space for the teaching. At the same time, of course, during the course of teaching this module, um, one of the students, well, two of the students during that time needed to be away. And then we moved into, into a process of blended learning where students might be on, uh, on a screen and the rest of the students would be in the room. So again, a really challenging um, experience um, of how to teach incorporating the, the screen and also students in the room. We call that blended learning in the UK. I mean, that might be a ubiquitous term, I don't know. But then we've gone into lockdown and now we are in full lockdown and that means that the university is closed at the moment and students can't go in there and neither can, can the staff. So everybody's working from home. Well, for some students, international students, that means they're working from their bedroom in a hall of residence. For me, I'm working from my study in my home, but it brings all sorts of implications working from home, about choosing the space, about how hospitable that is, about that lack of separation between going into a place of learning and incorporating that learning now and bringing that place of learning into your home and what new relationships that's going to create. What do you have around you? Where is it placed? Who else is in the home with you? And how much space do you have? And of course, the fact that your space is your unique space. 
it's not a shared physical space in the way that we would normally work where we're all meeting in a collective space of gathering. So there are various degrees of separation that are taking place under this, lock, un, under this lockdown and working from home is one of them. Of course, it goes without saying that the social isolation of lockdown has had a profound impact. And again, we've been through various stages of this where we've been in bubbles with families or six people meeting or uh, two households meeting and so on. Now we are very, very limited in terms of our contact. And it's only with a very limited contact with people outside the home and for limited time periods. So this impacts on our social being and the ways in which social interaction disperses feeling in all sorts of vicarious ways and is shared. Now, another important uh, um, aspect of what's happened in the lockdown, of course, has been homeschooling. And this has been devastating for some of our students where they're trying to maintain their learning. They're still maybe trying to do some work online, i.e. seeing clients online in their placements. They might be trying to do other work online, but they've also got children at home, children who are also isolated, who are not able to see their friends and they have to learn how to work online. And not only that, they're adjusting to all these new ways of learning just in the same way as their parents are or their carers. And so homeschooling and all the effects of that and the isolation on children and their development has had a profound effect. Workloads have also been affected by COVID. So for academics, I'm speaking very much about obviously my role and my colleagues. Well, colleagues get ill, colleagues are exhausted, they're burnt out. And of course, this is true in every single workplace. And what that means is that those who continue to work have found that their workloads have expanded exponentially. So we're in a situation where everybody's tired. It's difficult to maintain relationships because it isn't a case as it might be under more normal circumstances where one day somebody might be down because of what they're experiencing, but somebody else is in a better place because they're not suffering in the same way and they can give a helping hand. Now we are all burdened with the effects of this COVID and daily what's happening in the news, the sickness of relatives, the isolation and all of that. And that obviously um, means that there is the potentiality to share that, but also that sense of who's outside of this. Our supervisors are experiencing this as well. Our therapists are experiencing this as well. Everybody is inside the bubble of COVID. So, of course, when our managements try to conduct business as usual and they say things like, oh, well, you can do online yoga or let's set up a mindfulness group to you. Many colleagues are sitting there growling and feeling absolutely fed up and insulted and really want to say, please, can we change the business as usual? Can you try and lighten the burden a bit? Can you take away some aspects of the work? And it is possible to do that in order that what we do, which is getting more and more difficult, can be done with a bit more ease. So there are some very real tensions in, in labour relations right now in workplaces. I'm very, very aware of that as an active union member. And of course, all of these conditions impact upon our mental health and well-being. So how all of this, what we bring, how will that affect the teaching 
and learning online. Well, I've spoken already about the pressures that emerge from working conditions. But of course, what we're also bringing, as I also spoke about earlier on, is our relationship with technology. So given these difficult conditions, we now have to relate to a medium to which we may have quite conflicting feelings. We may be bringing a lot of personal anxiety. We may be bringing some professional anxiety. And that can be very high on the agenda, professional anxiety. Because of course, some colleagues are brilliant. They're fantastic. They're zipping all over the world, PowerPointing music, images flying in. It's wonderful, it's marvelous. Well, of course, I hold my hands up and say, that's not me. And very often I'm sitting there looking in envy at what other colleagues have managed to achieve and think, oh my goodness, I can't do that. Well, of course, maybe I could if I tried, if I could push back the space and say, give me some time to learn this, please. So there are professional anxieties that we bring, fears of being judged, fears of not being good enough, fears of not being able to be good enough for our students. So we're concerned about our students, whether they'll stay with us, whether they'll still come to their classes. We're concerned about the effects of what we're doing in terms of the student's safety. We're worried about, excuse me, we're worried, we're worried about the effects of what we do when students are in isolation and whether something might come up because we're not in the room and we can't fully see the effects of what we're doing. We're also concerned about the content of our curriculum and process and process questions. How do we deliver experiential learning, experiential learning, and embodied learning predicated on group process, which is how we train people to be therapists via a screen. How do we do it? Do we begin to feel like this? This is a picture of me actually performing um, during a lecture. This is not my response to COVID and, and this online technology, but it could be. Or maybe we feel like this. This is a picture painted by Bruegel of a figure called De La Greet, and I'm going to come back to that later on. So how might teaching online affect us as educators and therapists in the way that we deliver our tra training? Well, I've already referred to this whole restriction that we're working with we're working inside a frame the computer screen and yet what we're trying to do is we're trying to reach beyond it so what i'm going to suggest is that this is where our therapeutic and artistic vocabularies come into play which both help us to understand the process that we're engaged in and also to assist us in the various aspects of our process so in drama therapy, what we know is, of course, we work with the aesthetics of dramatic metaphor, our artistic vocabulary, in order to create a holding, a containing environment, which is drawn from the language of therapy, psychotherapy. So there we're drawing on a therapeutic vocabulary. Now, of course, when we're working live, we're thinking about literal space. We're thinking about bricks and mortar. We're thinking about walls. And we're thinking about how that literal space contains what Winnicott calls that potential space, that metaphorical potential. And within that material space, of course, we have, con we, we have control over how, in, uh, over how we, we work within that to an extent, of course. And of course, sometimes as therapists, as we know, we get moved around into different spaces. But the very first thing that we do, as Roger Granger says, is we create the space. We clear 
the space for our work. And it's something that drama therapists talk about all the time, that we have to make the space that we work in. But we do it materially in an embodied way. And within that, we're able to explore the metaphors of control, of choice. So the physical action allows us to enter into metaphor. Now online, we're working with different kinds of physical spaces. First of all, the computer screen, as we've acknowledged, and then the student's home, the teacher's home, or wherever they're working from. And these are going to constitute the working conditions with all the pressures that I've been speaking about. So let's think about this frame of the computer. And I have a conceit here in terms of making a comparison between the frame of the computer screen and the proscenium arch of the traditional theatre. And here I want to employ this concept of mise-en-scene because I think it can be really valuable to us. So within the mise-en-scene, and of course it's a filmic term, but it's also used in theatre, we think about this idea about what we put inside the frame. What's placed inside this frame? So in theatre, we think about design, we think about spatial relationship, we think about the use of props. Now in drama therapy, the prop becomes a projective object. So in this way, what we're doing is we're bringing that theatrical, artistic vocabulary in relation to the therapeutic vocabulary. And the mise-en-scene might contain these two vocabularies conceptually. And I'm very much thinking about this at the moment because I'm currently working with students teaching a module called Therapeutic Theatre, in which for the first time, rather than creating live performance, the students are going to be creating online performance. So the idea of what's contained inside the frame is absolutely fundamental um, to what we're doing. Now, in thinking about what goes inside the frame, I'm going to um, employ a couple of companions. The first companion is Brecht. Well, of course, anybody who knows me knows that Brecht is my companion uh, very frequently. And I'm very pleased. I know that I'm going to be, my presentation is going to be alongside Johannes Juncker, a German colleague. So that feels um, that feels very good too, especially since we've left Europe. But that, again, is another story. So Brecht is my continual companion. And one of the things that Brecht talks about in relation to his artistic endeavour, which is linked with his political endeavour, is this idea of laying bare society's causal networks, i.e., looking underneath we we see what we see but what's underneath that and in thinking about that and in the construction of his dramas and of course he created model books for those constructions and again there's a lot we could say about that what he's interested in is those relationships and how those uh, social relationships the causal networks can actually be made manifest in, 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 in a physical embodiment. So that thinking I'm taking into some of his theorizing, and in particular, an essay that he wrote, which was called The Alienating Effects, Alienation Effects in the Narrative Pictures of the Elder Bruegel. So this is where I'm going to return to that picture. I showed earlier on, which is this one. Now, of course, if we were together in the room, maybe we could have a conversation about this. I brought this picture up earlier on to evoke how we might be feeling at this time of COVID. There's a central figure there who, in some ways, appears to be quite melded into her environment. Just as we are in COVID, we're all 
part of this complex environment and perhaps we feel that we're kind of blended into it and if you look at the way that the the construction of this painting in terms of the use of color we really have to look to pick her out and to find her shape and this is what it might feel like now dollar greet is based um this is a, a painting um by the elder bruegel um from um the 16th century, 1563. Dolagrit is from is is a character in in Flemish folklore. She's also known as Mad Margaret. She goes with this group of women to pillage in hell, and look, she's facing the jaws of hell here. But she's very well armed. Look at her. She's got food. She's got a frying pan. She's got a metal breastplate and she's got um, a weapon here. She's striding forward. Now, Brecht talks about this um, picture and says that anybody who's playing the role of, of the character Grusha in his play, The Caucasian Chalk Circle, should have a look at this picture. Because in that play, Grusha, who becomes the adoptive mother of a young child, and who flees in order to preserve his life, much like often the drama therapist feels under siege in order to preserve the life of their clients or preserve the life of their work. Brecht suggests that whoever plays Grusha needs to look at this painting, painted by Bruegel, and look at the resilience of this character, but also look at her in this context where she's forging forward in hell, facing the jaws of hell. And here's another picture that Brecht wrote about in this essay. And this is a painting called The Fall of Icarus. Now, again, we could have a conversation if we were together about where is Icarus? Now we know the story of Icarus, who is an, in an act of hubris, creates wings and made of feathers and wax. But of course he flies too close to the sun and his wings melt and poor old Icarus ends up in the water. Now here's my mouse here so I can show you, there's Icarus. But when we first look at the painting, we have to find it. Now, what Brecht is inviting us to do by looking at this picture is to notice how catastrophic events can happen, but also life can carry on as well. Look at the attention to the ploughing that's going on here. Look at all of the other elements that are going on. And yet here's Icarus with his hand held up, seeking help. So there's a great deal that we could unpack in these pictures and wonder about this as a mise-en-scene and wonder what it's saying to us. Where is our attention being pulled? Where do we look? And what do we make of it? How do we interpret it? Now, another helper that I've enlisted here in my thinking about this idea of mise-en-scene is the art historian and critic John Berger, who made a profound and significant contribution to thinking about particularly the visual arts in his book, um, which is based on a BBC television series, which was made in 1972. And this was called Ways of Seeing. And again, what Berger wanted us to do was to look beyond the apparent surface image like Brecht and see what's going on here beyond the surface. And I'm going to refer here to a particular painting. And again, this is something that um, is, is very well known in, in Berger's work. And you can Google this, look it up to actually see the, the film clip um, of a painting where he comments on a painting by Thomas Gainsborough, of 70, the English landscape artist, um, where he talks about uh, this, this painting called 
Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews are landowners. And here they are in this exquisite landscape, beautifully, exquisitely painted by Gainsborough. And they've been employed by him to present this Id idyll of the landowners in their beautiful landscape. But what Berger asks us to do is to think a bit beyond this and to think about the social context in which we're looking at this. At this time, somebody who came onto this land and stole a potato would probably end up being whipped. If you were a poacher and stole a rabbit, you were eligible for deportation. So this is a very particular view that reinforces the class position of these two people. And what it doesn't show us, it's a very selective view of what's happening in this countryside. Because just behind this tree here might well be somebody else who, if he does find a rabbit and he's caught, might be deported, which of course is very different from the experience of these people. Now, another version of this painting that I want to show you is this one. And this is made by a Nigerian British artist. Just spend a couple of moments looking at this painting. Sorry, looking at this um, uh, 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 sculpture. It's using traditional fabrics from uh, uh, Nigeria to clothe these two figures, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. But as we can see, they're headless. And this is the name of this paint, this um, uh, sculpture. Mr. and Mrs. Andrews headless and clothed in cotton fabric. And this is by Yika Shonibar, and it was made in 1998. So this is another view, another way of thinking and developing that that artwork that we've been just been looking at and recreating the mise-en-scene, refashioning that work in order to give us another view. And Shonibar's uh, work is a commentary on land, on ownership, through the lens of post-colonialism. So he's thinking about that idea of the British as a colonial power. So we go from that Gainsborough's idyllic painting and Berger's commentary on it, and now into more recent times and this fresh interpretation of it. So now I'm coming to the end of my presentation and I'm going to be finishing shortly. I've brought together what might seem some very different and disparate elements. And I guess it's because it's an offering, an opening to contribute to the conversation that's going on. Because of course, we're all coming together and we don't know what each other's going to say. And so we're opening up a set of experiences and some ideas to think about together. And I'm looking forward to having those conversations with everybody on Sunday. So to finish, um, I guess I'm asserting something that we all know as artists and clinicians, that creativity survives. That was what we do as therapists. We look for the healthy, creative parts in our clients. And as educators, we work with creativity all the time because we believe in its potentiality for healing. And we also know that even in the harshest conditions, creativity can survive. And this is what Roger Granger, our dear colleague and well missed colleague Roger Granger talks, calls the faith of the drama therapist. So I'm going to be finishing shortly with 
an exhortation, I guess, which is let's embrace technology in this time of COVID, even if we're afraid. And I'm one of those people who is afraid and also began a skeptical. Let's embrace it and let's make it work for us. So I'll stop my screen share so that I can come back and say thank you for being with me. I'm sure that my presentation has gone over time and I apologize for that. And I'm looking forward to being with you on Sunday. Thank you.